Do you have to be cool to be good? We'll find out this week on Motoring 2005. SN's Motoring 2005 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that. You know, you gotta hand it to Honda. It's a company that builds a product that in Bill Gardner's words is bulletproof. But it's also a company that knows how to keep a vehicle interesting and fresh. I mean, shortly after Honda arrived in Canada in 1973, it introduced the Civic. Well, almost 30 years later, Honda sold 8,400 Civics just last August. That's the most they've ever sold in one single month. And you know, Honda is also a company that learns from its mistakes. It was back in 1995, the company got into the light truck market with the Odyssey. Based on the Accord, the Odyssey was too small and it was underpowered. Well, the company was quick to make some revisions and bring in the new and improved version in 1998. Well, six years and 70,000 sales later, the Odyssey is without a doubt the benchmark in this segment. But Honda is not finished yet. And this week we find ourselves in Alberta to check out the third generation Honda Odyssey. If you look at this vehicle as a minivan, it comes up shy in a couple of ways. First of all, it doesn't have enough trunk space. And second of all, it could do with a few more horses under the hood. However, if you look at this vehicle as a very practical and versatile station wagon, it fits the bill and fits the bill very nicely. The van market was a, a very big part of the Canadian marketplace uh, ever since uh, you know, Chrysler invented it and uh, we had wanted to get into it. Uh, in 95 the only vehicle that we had was a, a vehicle from Japan uh, that we, we brought over called the Odyssey. It was a small Accord based vehicle but to compete in the mainstream we had to get into a, you know, a, a much bigger size. It took a while in development, but when we introduced the previous generation Odyssey, it became very successful for us. We sold over 70,000 of them in the, last, in the past six years. The competition has improved. We firmly believe they've targeted the Odyssey because it has been the benchmark product for the last uh, number of years. So we went back to the drawing board uh, and from the ground up have developed a brand new product. It's uh, our first truck with our new global truck platform, so uh, everything's new from the ground up. Powertrain is a 3.5 liter V6 VTEC engine. So on the, on the base models, it, it uh, has the standard engine. On the upper end models, we have the VCM uh, technology added to that. 255 horsepower, 250 foot-pounds of torque. So that's up from uh, the previous generation, which was 240 horsepower. We feel the interior is quite revolutionary for the segment, um, especially with uh, fit and finish and uh, when we look at some of our uh, storage and uh, cargo uh, flexibility and the utility overall. And we've also, uh, again, thought from the ground up, the third row, we've rethought everything. Uh, we have uh, the new 60-40 split and it's now uh, one motion uh, stowable. So it's uh, considerably easier than some of the competition out there. And we feel that uh, especially a lot of the mothers out there who are going to be driving their kids around will come to appreciate, uh, appreciate that as well. I think it's still a soccer mom vehicle. I, s I believe that people, they have no choice to buy a minivan. They have a large family or they need space and it's still the best vehicle for those uh, needs. But I think they have no choice to buy it. So that's why maybe the market is not dead. There's still a lot of uh, minivans sold. Uh, the, the best selling vehicle in Canada is minivans, so it has to do something with the... Uh, but the image is not there. Even if everybody's trying to give a sexy look to the minivan, it's still a minivan. Uh, they've got a nice interior, nice fit. All the feelings are just great. You touch the wheel, the steering wheel, it's bigger in your hands. And you touch the buttons and everything is there. Soft touch, the pedals, everything is very uh, 
I believe they put a lot of energy on those aspects you touch. Tough question. I know you work for Honda. How old are you and would you buy a minivan? Right now I'm 26 and uh, not quite in the minivan demographic yet, but down the road if I did, granted I'm biased, but Odyssey would be right up there. If not, it would be number one on my list. I'm not sure we want to get away from that image because I think, you know, that's a reality. But our vehicle, we really believe, has that great element of really being a driver's car. You really feel good behind the wheel. It does not drive like a typical minivan. Okay, let's see, 282.48 divided into a lesson in new math later on Kenzie's Corner. Let's see, that's 382. You know, Ford may have declared this to be the year of the car, but nobody's pushing more new product out the front door than GM. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at the replacement for the Pontiac Grand Am. This is the all-new G6. The first thing to know about the new G6 is its lineage. Basically, it shares its platform with the likes of the Saab 93 and Chevy Malibu. The importance of this is that it brings a rock-solid foundation to the car, one that allows the rest of it to function as it should. It also means the G6 rides on a long 2,853mm wheelbase, which means much more room than the outgoing Grand Am. Indeed, its wheelbase is about 125mm longer than most of its mid-sized competition. You know, the rear seat environment has been reworked almost as well as the front. To begin with, because this car is based on the Malibu Max, you get a ton of leg room, and indeed also enough room under the seats to put your feet. It really is very comfortable. Now, if you're tall as I am, headroom's a little tight, but that's not where this car trips over its shoelaces. Quite simply, the sash line is very high and the roof line very low. The combination, the sight lines are not very good, especially if you happen to be shorter in nature, like a child. The other problem, whenever you get in and out, remember the old word, duck. Because if you don't, it hurts. <laughs> that platform also gives the sport tuned suspension. McPherson struts up front and a four link system in back, a wonderful place to hang its hat. Ditto the feel and feedback through the electrically assisted power steering. For a GM, Corvette aside of course, this is a rare and likeable trait that bodes well for future cars and the road manners it all promises. For the sake of the pile on test, we've upgraded from the base G6 to this G6 GT and primarily to get the larger rubber. The base tyres, well they really aren't up to very much and they're noisy, so if you do decide to buy a G6, you've got to do one of two things. Either upgrade the rubber at the time of purchase on the base car or go with the GT because the larger tyres really do allow you to take the best advantage of this car's handling characteristics, which are in fact very good. Now, too bad that the same can't be said of the mirror. If it was an easy solution, it would be wonderful. As it stands, there's a lot of blind spots with this car, primarily because of the unusual shape of the mirror. With the larger 17-inch wheels and tyres aboard, the G6 really does hunker down and put its best wheel forward. The larger tyres also help in the braking department. Pity the same cannot be said of the anti-lock brakes. While both the testers featured them, GM insists on gouging after the fact, to the tune of about $600 or so. This from a company that promised to be the first with anti-lock brakes as standard equipment on every car it sold. The good news is, well, the G6 gets a full complement of airbags. You know, when you get behind the wheel of the new G6, you will not recognize it as a Pontiac, primarily because the old hodgepodge cobbled together look it's gone the way of the dodo bird. In its place, a very classy finish. One piece instrument panel, decent set of instruments, and an entirely logical center stack. One that puts all of the controls right where they should be. Now if you throw 500 bucks at this car, you get a height adjustable seat and power adjustable pedals. Combine that with the tilt and telescopic steering, and the driver of just about any stature can find the right and correct driving position. One pet peeve. When you look in the rear view mirror, all you see are the speaker grills reflecting off the back glass. 
Power for the new G6 comes from a derivative of the V6 that's powered many a Pontiac. In its latest guise, it displaces 3.5 litres and produces 200 horsepower and a commendable 220 pounds-feet of torque. Needless to say, in a relatively light automobile, this equates to decent performance. The engine is also a smooth and willing worker, only getting a little noisy as it stretches towards the top end of the rev range. This work ethic is nicely supported by a slick shifting four-speed automatic. True of GM's other trannies, they don't come much better. The GT also includes a manual mode, which adds a sporting touch to the overall drive. You know, the new G6 just does not disappoint, primarily because it's exactly as build, an affordable sporty sedan. That wonderful platform and a decent suspension give it an agility that's the equal of its competition. However, there are two things that disappoint. First of all, paying $600 for anti-lock brakes in this day and age is disgraceful. The second thing, if you want the real deal, you're going to have to wait until 2006, because that's when this car earns a 240 horsepower engine. Our Midas tip of the week concerns protecting your car's finish. There's an awful lot of things that come out of the atmosphere that can damage the finish of your car. For example, this car hasn't been washed in a while and there's a lot of grit and dirt all over this car. That's not a problem until somebody brushes up against it or places an object on there and then moves it across the finish, which will produce scratches. Now, there's also a major factor in the northeast portion of North America with industrial fallout, namely sulfur dioxide from manufacturing plants. That sulfur dioxide settles on your car's finish and then when it's wetted, or in other words when it gets rained on, it forms a dilute form of sulfuric acid. That's the stuff in your car's battery and I'm sure you know how corrosive that is. It'll permanently etch or mark the paint if you leave it on there long enough and get it wet enough times. Other things like bird droppings can be a big problem. One important way to protect your paint is once, once a year buy a good quality paste wax and put a good coat of wax over your car that'll seal up little nicks and scratches, imperfections and it'll buy you a little bit of time to get things like these bird droppings and tree sap off the finish before they permanently mark it. Anything like this that's acidic that's left on there long enough if you leave it on there eventually it will mark the car the wax will buy you a little bit of time. That's your Midas tip of the week. Kind of neat, actually. I uh, got an invite from Goodyear to go down to the uh, Goodyear-sponsored Extreme Rock Crawling Championships, uh, being held just outside uh, Phoenix. It's a bit of an eye-opener of an event. Uh, I've done a bit of off-roading over the years, but uh, I've never seen uh, vehicles put through, you know, put through sections of, uh, of rock and terrain and whatnot as extreme as uh, as these. It really merits the name Extreme Rock Crawling, you know. Uh, nine sections of terrain over big rocks in a stream bed, in this case out in the desert, a dry, dry stream bed. And uh, in each section there are flags to, march, to mark a, uh, a course through the, uh, through the section. And uh, the trucks are observed as they drive through. And if they knock over flags, stop, or reverse, they lose points. At the end of the day, the chap with the lowest score is the, uh, is the winner, you know, who's made the least uh, mistakes. And, uh, you know, some of the terrain is, is pretty awesome, you know. Some people may watch this and go, are these people out of their minds? But what do you, what do you it's, it's, it's... Well, it's, there is certainly an element of danger. Uh, we saw two, uh, I saw one, and then there was another vehicle actually rolled over. Um, but the, uh, the speeds are, are very low. There's no sort of, you know, racing around. It's all crawling, quite literally. And uh, in a couple of instances, they just kind of got at extreme angles and fell over. Um, mind you, they don't, they don't wear helmets, and uh, they're only held in by lap belts, so maybe there's a little bit of craziness in there, so...
The new 2005 Honda Odyssey comes equipped with two versions of the 3.5 six-cylinder VTEC engine. One is the ordinary VTEC, the other one comes equipped with something called VCM, or Variable Cylinder Management. How does it work? Well, let's say you're on the highway under light throttle and light load. Three cylinders will simply shut down. Apply the throttle, and those three will spring back to life. Now, Honda says it will reduce fuel consumption between 7 and 10 percent. Now, that may not seem like a lot, but if you multiply that times millions of vehicles on the road, we're talking a few tankfuls. All right, let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner. Well, Brad, you know Cadillac cars in the early 80s had a, a system they called V864, where their big V8s would run on six or even four cylinders, depending on how much load. Variable displacement is very appealing because you can have a sort of the best of both worlds. You can have uh, the, the power of a big engine for acceleration or trailer towing and the economy of a small engine when you're cruising or decelerating. So it's, it's a good idea. Anyhow, I want to talk to you about some problems that I've had with my own car over the last few months. You might actually find it kind of funny or ironic, but uh, this car, you'll often see it used on motoring. I, it's sort of my guinea pig for whatever I want to talk about on, that, on any given week, so we quite often use it. It's an 88 Pontiac Grand Prix. We call them a W car. The letter designation within GM is a W car. Now, uh, they're great on fuel, and they don't rust too bad. The, the bodies were pretty well made. But uh, mechanical reliability is uh, not their strong point, uh, to put it mildly. But the neat thing about them is they're like uh, kittens when you live in the country. They're basically free to a good home after they're about 8 or 10 years old because there's so many mechanical problems with them, people want to pretty well give them to you. I bought this one for uh, a, a thousand bucks about five years ago. It's an 88, so, you know, uh, I've got my money's worth and more out of it. It's done a lot of long trips to the States because it gets such super gas mileage. But starting uh, this summer, uh, on Mother's Day, I was on my way to my mom's place, muffler falls off. Well, no big deal, but these engines are really loud when the muffler falls off, ear-splitting noise. So I turn around and limp it back home, get the pickup truck. No big deal, put a new muffler on it a couple of days later. A couple of weeks later, this O-ring lets go. Uh, in this engine where the distributor used to be when these engines had a distributor, there's now an oil pump drive. There's an O-ring where that oil pump drive enters the engine case. It should be nice and flexible. This one's hard as a rock. It cracked. Out comes the engine oil, big leak. Change that, I'm, I'm out of the woods, right? Two weeks later, I come out in the parking lot, huge puddle of fuel underneath the car. There's a fuel line under, underneath at the rear of the engine uh, that's got a pinhole in it from rust, and it's leaking like crazy. Now, the car was rust-proofed underneath, so most of the line was pretty good. I only had to change one little section. The rust was very localized, but nonetheless, huge leak, and I was dead in the water till I fixed that fuel leak. So I thought I'm out of the woods again, right? A couple of weeks later, a howling starts in the front of the car. It gets unbearably noisy over the next few weeks, so I gotta change the right front wheel bearing. No big deal, it's an 88 car, a million miles on it. Not unexpected for a wheel bearing to go, but they're expensive, 225 bucks. Labor's my own time, no big deal. I changed that part, I'm all fixed up, right? A Couple of weeks later, one of the rear struts goes. This is the rear strut out of this car or shock absorber in, in some uh, people's language. Now, the rear strut in this car is completely gone. If you know how one of these things should work, th there should be a lot of resistance. This is a hydraulic damper for the rear suspension, and in order for me to move that rod in and out, there should be an awful lot of resistance, and it should move very slowly and steadily in both directions. All the oil came out of this one, and it's shot. Pretty expensive job if you had to pay somebody else. Luckily, I just do it all myself and keep fixing. But, you know, it's one of those deals where you don't know when to pull the plug on an older car. Now, for me, it's a different story buying the parts at wholesale in my own time. I'll fix this thing forever. But if you own this car, and I was thinking the other day, you know, I wonder if one of my customers owned this car, if they'd have had the patience with me to bear with me for all these repairs that have happened on this car over the summer. And, you know, some of you can get a good laugh at me. I know Brad's standing behind the camera there going, yeah, serves you right, wrench boy. You got your, it's poetic justice. I got my, uh, got my just desserts having to fix my own car. Anyhow, till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2005. J.D. Power's most recent survey finds that there are two vehicles that consumers complain the most about fuel consumption. Number one is the Hummer. But number two 
was the Toyota Prius. Now, that's a bit of a surprise because the Prius gets pretty good fuel consumption. The problem is twofold. First of all, nobody gets what Transport Canada says they're going to get. But particularly in the Prius's case, it actually gets a better number in the city than it does on the highway. That's because the vehicle shuts itself off when it's stopped at a traffic light. Now, even in city driving, most of it's actually done on urban freeways. So we're actually traveling more on the highway than we probably think we do. But Toyota thinks there's also an issue in terms of the way we measure fuel usage. You can either do it on the basis of fuel consumption, that would be liters per 100 kilometers, or you can do it in terms of mileage, which is kilometers per liter. Now, obviously, they measure the same thing. One's just the reciprocal of the other. But a difference of five to six liters per 100 kilometers, that's only one lousy little digit, translates to a difference between 20 and 16.6 .6 kilometers per liter. That's a difference of 3.3. So it seems like a bigger advantage. But the fact is, it doesn't really matter because the biggest cost factor in any new car purchase is depreciation, not fuel usage. For at least three or four years, you don't really have to worry about fuel consumption. Prius happens to have extremely low depreciation. So why are you worried about fuel consumption? Quit your complaining. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, it was exactly 100 years today that the first car arrived here in Banff Springs, Alberta. And you know, the population hasn't grown much either. It stands around 4,600, but each year, Banff is home to close to 5 million visitors. Okay, some final thoughts on the Honda Odyssey. Well, simply put, they have taken a good car and made it better. And I know there's a lot of people out there who still think minivans are boring. But let me tell you something, you get in an Odyssey or its biggest competitor, the Toyota Sienna, and you'd swear you were sitting inside a luxury sedan or sport utility. So there you go. Graham will have a much closer look on a future test drive. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. The challenge was to create my own dream car. So. Uh, we really uh, try to make our design dreams come true. TSN's Motoring 2005 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that.